you ever noticed that things get weird when like money is introduced? Like things kind of get weird when money's introduced into like a, a situation. Uh, maybe you remember the first time that you were at a restaurant with your friends and everybody ordered something and, and somehow the waiter stuck the, stuck the bill right next to you and you're like, I gotta figure out how to pay this bill with everybody, right? And as, as that thing gets put next to you and you sort of open it up, next thing you know, somebody's putting eight single dollar bills, two quarters, four dimes, one nickel, and four pennies and saying, my burger was $8.99. And as you're counting that, you look up and they're like gone. They just like disappeared and you're like, well, what about the tax? What about the tip? What about the three appetizers that you suggested we share together, right? And, you know, and so there's that guy. And then as you're counting that up, everybody else is giving you their $8.99, including the guy who got three refills, didn't realize that they don't give free refills for beer. And all of a sudden, you're like trying to put this thing together. And you're like, how are we going to do this, right? Things just kind of get weird sometimes when money's introduced. I know, I, I know I've seen this. I've seen other folks have to deal with this in really painful ways with their family of origin when someone dies and you have to sort things out, sometimes it gets weird. Uh, there's, I think there's one very, very simple and clear explanation for this, is that money is currency, right? And uh, a currency means that it, it's a current to the things that really matter, right? For example, I've got this lamp up here. I don't like this lamp. If you want it, you can take it. First person up here can have it, right? But what happens is um, uh, you turn it on, um, and, and, and we get a good thing. We get light because there's an electrical current running uh, from the stage into this lamp. Uh, but what happens, though, if you break the current, you lose the good thing. Well, uh, in so many things in our life, Money is the currency that gets us from where we are to that good thing, okay? Uh, as we're in church, uh, we're, we, uh, we're talking about two sets of currency, right? Uh, our faith is a currency that enables us to connect to God and get all of his good things. Money is a currency that brings us to other good things. And if you remember Ghostbusters, right, what was the one thing they said? Do not do this, right? Do not cross the streams, right? Now, if you, and now, if you haven't seen Ghostbusters, you, you might remember when the guy says, don't cross the streams, somebody says, why? Why don't you want to cross the streams? And they said, well, bad things will happen. Like, what kind of bad things would happen if you cross the streams? And uh, if I'm, I'm remembering what the scientist said, he said, well, imagine all of life uh, that you know it's ceasing to exist and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light, all right? So um, I'm hoping for better things as we cross the streams this morning uh, because Jesus had no problem talking about money and Paul had no problem talking about money because uh, from their perspective, God has an, an awful lot of good for us when it comes to these topics. So uh, we are wrapping up our series on the book of Philippians. Uh, we have actually, we have one more to do next week, a special message on Father's Day. We kept one, maybe like the best passage in, one of the best passages in Philippians. We held it back for next week for We'll explain that why next week. But uh, um, we're literally coming to the end of Philippians chapter 4. And what you have is Paul talking to the, those in Philippians about the way they are using their finances to fund the ministry. And so we'll talk through that. Uh, one of the things I did uh, to prepare for this message is I decided to open source it. I sent, I posted on social media and I sent an email out to a whole bunch of people and said, hey, what are the questions you guys have about giving to the church? Uh, what are some of your thoughts you've had? And I gathered up 41 bullet points of questions and thoughts that you had. So we'll trickle those things in along the way as well. So uh, let's read the passage though. So go ahead and stand with me. Uh, we're going to read. Uh, we'll read it all together uh, from Philippians chapter 4. Uh, 
Let's read together. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you were sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. All right, thanks. Go ahead and have a seat. So, uh, really simply, uh, Paul, Paul says, it was good of you to give to me, he said. Uh, he, uh, in, in la- last week, we talked about uh, how Paul had experienced contentment and the power of that contentment. And particularly, though, uh, that's really helpful for all of us. But Paul particularly speaks to those who serve in ministry, the importance of not letting that ever get entangled up with money. But for, for us and for our part, we're going to focus on the last, verse, last six verses, verses 14 to 20, where he said, it was good of you, it was good of you to have given to me. And we're going to talk about three reasons. The first reason is why it's good to give, uh, particularly to the church, is that he says this, it supplies what is needed for ministry. Uh, a, little bit of a, back, a little bit of background, I've shared this a little bit before. Uh, Paul is writing to uh, a, a group of believers uh, who are formed in like different churches in the city of Philippi. And uh, at that time, they would gather their gifts on a regular basis, and they, were, they had been sharing those gifts with Paul. Now, Paul had planted that church, and, uh, and, and Philip, Philippi was in the region of Macedonia. So think like Westchester in the Philadelphia region, okay? So um, Philadelphia, uh, Philippi was in that region. And when he left that region, the Philippians still wanted to kind of give to him along the way. But after a while, that had stopped. And next thing you know, Paul is imprisoned in Rome. Now, he had spent time in like dungeon and torture type prisons. He wasn't in a dungeon torture type prison. He was in house arrest. So he's still able to write letters, but he still had no means to provide. It's not like um, they had like Uber Eats dropping stuff off for Paul on a regular basis. Uh, He literally had no way to provide. And so other people had to take care of him. And so the Philippians uh, heard about this and they're like, all right, let's gather up some money and let's send it with Epaphroditus and let's make sure we take care of Paul uh, because, hey, that's, he's part of the church. He's part of the family. We need to take care of him as he serves. And so this letter is, was partially written as a thank you note to them and to, an, to encourage them to rejoice um, as he is rejoicing and not to, and not to get uh, discouraged by some of the challenges they face. Uh, but one of the things he says, it's, it's really good of you to give. Uh, but one of the things he says, he says, look, uh, you are the only ones that gave to me. And there's a specific reason for that. I'm gonna u- I want to use that to kind of explain how like, the, the church uh, uh, originally thought about giving and how that has kind of like formed over time. So uh, Paul, living 2,000 years ago, ancient Rome, 1,400 years before that, uh, Moses uh, was preparing the Israelites to go into the promised land. And, and uh, Moses, uh, through, you know, through God's leadership and, and, and his writings, uh, established a, a really effective system 
for pastoral and spiritual care in those days. All right, so uh, 12, the 12 tribes of Israel were going into Israel, and every single tribe was going to get like a big allotment of land, right? So think of like a big, big county in New Jersey, all right? If Israel's like the size of New Jersey, some, you know, Judah gets Burlington County, Benjamin gets Camden County, uh, Dan, they get like Monmouth County or something like that. Anyway, but they all get like a county, right? Uh, and and that's, that's hugely important because it's not like, you know, they had like, they, they weren't like doing internet security jobs and they were kind of working from home and they got their, uh, they got their paycheck deposited into their account every couple of weeks. Uh, you know, in those days, you, you either had land or you, you worked for people who had land. And if you had land, you were able to develop it and develop gardens and farms and, or, or maybe livestock along the way. And, and that was your entire livelihood. And so uh, all the tribes get, got a, a, an allotment of land, and every family in those tribes got their allotment of land when they got to the promised land, except one tribe. One tribe got nothing. They literally got zero. Every, they got no land at all. Uh, instead of getting land to provide for themselves, they received a calling. And so the tribe of Levi was called to be the, the, the priests for the entire nation. And so the, uh, they, would, they would take care of the tabernacle, and then they would spread throughout every single one of the villages in Israel so that every single village had a priesthood to help people know that God was near to them, that God would care for them, and God would provide for them. And so this priesthood would take care of the spiritual needs of the people of Israel and, uh, and attend to the facilities of the temple, the tabernacle, and eventually the different little synagogues that were all the way uh, spread out through the nation of Israel. And uh, so they, but they, they needed to be provided for. And so since they didn't get any land, what the, the deal was is that every one of the families and the tribes, they would give one-tenth of whatever they brought in from their harvest to provide for the Levitical priesthood. And so that's how the idea of the tithe came along. The tithe was to take care of the spiritual leadership within the life of Israel. It would take care of the priesthood, it would take care of like the facilities, it would take care of what was needed for that. And so you translate that to um, all of a sudden Jesus comes, he dies, he resurrects, and says, look, it's not just about Israel, it's about the whole world. And all of a sudden churches start popping up everywhere. And particularly in the Jewish areas, like what they do, they just started giving 10% and they started being able to provide for their own spiritual leadership and, 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 be, and they were able to kind of build up the church church quickly. But there's something different in the New Testament. Something different happened. It wasn't just about the particular churches and the particular groups. They started recognizing, wait a second, this, God, this good news is for everybody. We need to get this word out. And so uh, Paul and a group of believers start traveling uh, in what is known as apostolic adventures. The apostles got sent everywhere. And what you start seeing throughout the Roman world was not just giving going towards the, the, their churches. Giving would also start going towards these various apostolic adventures. Uh, adventures? Ventures. Maybe some of them were adventures, but some of them were boring, right? But apostolic ventures. And so Paul was traveling and churches would provide for him. Um, eventually, as that that continued to build into the life of the church, and you would have uh, funds for the church going to the church itself, and then it would go to the monastic movement, which, which was all, historically, originally, a missionary movement to reach people. And you fast forward today, generally speaking, the same basic principle applies. Uh, uh, fun, uh, Christians typically give to their church and to different, what I'm going to call apostolic adventures. These, these aren't people who write scriptures. These are people that get out there and do a variety of things that a church can't do. And so uh, we, uh, as a church, we help uh, fund folks uh, from Young Life uh, who, who help uh, get, who help build a youth group for uh, kids who wouldn't have a youth group normally. Uh, or uh, for maybe a college student ministry like Crew, or uh, missionaries like Wycliffe Bible Translators. Uh, that's how the, the church it takes care of itself, through the, the fundamental approach of tithing to take care of the church, 
and to send uh, apostolic ventures around the world. Makes sense, right? Okay. So that's, that's the fundamental thing that was going on. And so for Paul saying, hey, just so you know, you're the Philippians, you're the first one to get this apostolic venture kind of thing. Uh, but thankfully it caught on. And in many ways, th- these two things provide both the foundation for ongoing spiritual care for God's people and the entrepreneurial spirit that continues to reinvent and keep the vision of the church fresh. All right, got it? All right, that brings us to our first frequently asked question. And this was the most asked question that when I put it out there, more people asked this question than any other question. They said, okay, well, where does all the money go? Good, good question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what, what our budget looks like and uh, what, you know, what the typical budget of a church is once it hits maturity. Um, we're sort of in a church plan mode. You can take a look at, you can take a look at this. This is where our resources go, and this is very high level. Uh, our budget is just a little north of $500,000 a year. Uh, just a little over 62% of that goes to staff. Uh, almost 20% goes to facility, and the rest of it goes to ministry and outreach, okay? Uh, now, that's not where we want it to be. This is a typical church plant budget, so this is one of the things that as we grow, our, church, our, our budget will look a little bit more like a typical mature church's budget, which looks like this, where about 50% of uh, what's given goes to staff, uh, 20% of it goes to ministry and administrative different things, whether it's children, adults, wh- uh, whatever. Um, uh, 20% goes to facility and 10% goes to outreach. And so as we grow into our budget, we want it to look more like this. And yes, we're going to have to grow into our budget. Uh, now, the second question was actually the first question asked. I put this thing out in about four seconds, my sister responded on Facebook, okay? And, and, she, and she responded like a typical Lucenius would, all right? This is how we think, and this is how I thought about just about every church budget for the first 15, 20 years of my life. She's like, well, all right, well, tell me how much of that money is really getting to the community, right? How much of it is going to the community? And, you know, as in, in the early years of my faith, I would say 10%, that's awful, that stinks. We need to get more money to those outside. The church. We need to get more money to the community. Uh, and uh, I agree. Uh, but uh, as I have like, as I have sort of a grown sort of in my own faith and as I've kind of thought about this, one of the things I've kind of come to terms with is that the church isn't the United Way. It's not like a slush fund to get money to things out there, right? And the original vision for Israel wasn't to like gather funds so that Israel could be like comfortable and never need anything ever, right? The vision for Israel is that they were going to give and they were going to understand their spiritual leadership and they're going to be a light to the nations. Israel was going to be absolutely different. They're going to have the Sabbath The rest of the world has to work seven days and to stress whether the harvest is going to come in. The people of Israel were going to be well rested and to trust God with their harvest. The rest of the world would have tyrants that would tax tax them like crazy. The people of Israel would have leaders that would be known by their integrity. And, And those who would follow them will also have that kind of integrity and, uh, and the leaders were there to serve the people, not to take from the people. The people of Israel would be absolutely different as they trusted God in, in, with their rest, as they trusted God with their leadership, as they cared for one another. That they, the, the law was to love your Lord, the God with all your heart, mind, soul, and with all your strength, love your neighbors yourself, and to love the foreigner who sojourned among them. The, the people of Israel are to be radically different than the world around them. And, and, and the same thing comes to the church. 
you know, we're not giving, there's, there's no way I would ever pass a church where only 10% of it benefited the community. 100% of everything that comes in 930 must be committed to caring for the community, helping people find their way back to God. Because Jesus' answer isn't like a nonprofit in the world out there. Jesus' answer to the world is, you know, 930 tells the story of our name, where Jesus looks at, looks at the crowds, and he has compassion on them. Why? Because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. These are humans with human problems. They need a human solution. The world needs a church, not a nonprofit. Nothing wrong with nonprofits, and we need more of them, right? But nonprofits are formed by people who want to care for people. And so Jesus' solution is not funding for initiatives. The Jesus' solution for the world is people. And, we're to, and every dollar that we gather must be shaping us to be the kind of people that are well-rested, who trust God with our harvest, who trust God with our finances, who trust God in order to not just to, not to grab authority, to have it, but to serve with everything we've been given and to be a transforming light and presence, salt and light in everything we do. And, and if our funds are, done, are used well, every every second that every single one of us live will be increasingly transformed by God's love and grace. And of course, that will produce unbelievable fruit in the community. So um, now there are more details on our budget. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer any of one of them. Um, and as our membership grows, there's a, we'll have a process where everyone, where, where, these, where these things get approved and, and we can go into more details on them. But we got a message, we need to move it along. So, um, so the second thing here uh, as, as to why it's good is that it's a credit to the account of the giver. All right, so... Um, it's a credit to the account of the giver. Now, um, if you're an accountant, you'll know that when somebody gives money from one, out of their account, it's not a credit to their account, it's a debit to their account. You might have something that looks like this. Um, this is a debit card, and if you have a debit card, every time you use it, money leaves your account, it doesn't go into your account. Uh, but what well, Paul says to the Philippians, he says, you need, you need to understand that when you are giving, it's actually crediting your account. And they're like, well, what, what kind of funny math are you doing, Paul? Um, because that's not how it works for me. Um, uh, but for, for Paul, what Paul is doing here is he's doing a couple things here. First, he's over-communicating. Every time Paul brings up money, he just uses an awful lot of words. Why? Because anytime you're, you're talking about money and faith, you're crossing streams, right? And so you need to be specifically and specifically careful, right? Because you're talking about powerful things, right? Never leave anybody alone with money, sex, and power, right? Because there are powerful things. You don't cross those streams. Which brings us to our next frequently asked question, number three. So what kind of safeguards do you have in place? Uh, one of the things that I got out of this is I heard just a few horror stories about people's experiences with church and, and money. And that's one of the reasons why we don't pass a plate around here. Uh, uh, we live in a, particularly our region, just has a lot of baggage when it comes to church and money. And if you're new here, we don't want to put an, a plate under your nose saying, gimme, 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 gimme. God can provide all of what we need. And that's one of the things Paul wants to say to the Philippians. Look, I'm fine. I'm fine. It was, you know, like, it was really, really helpful. But even if you didn't give, I would have been fine. We don't need your money, Paul's saying. Um, and so it's important that uh, basic safeguards are in place. And, and there's a playbook for the church on this. And when churches that apply that playbook, you know, bad things don't happen. We have, we have an outside bookkeeper who makes sure all receipts aren't, there's no funny monkey business. We have, an, we have a management team outside of our church that oversees me, oversees our budget, makes sure it stays uh, mission true. There's only, ever since the beginning, only two, maybe three people has, have access to see what people give. It's just sort of the basic things that are done, and we just hold to those things. Why? Because that's just the right thing. You want to be safe. Uh, so, but I said Paul is doing a couple of things. First, he's over-communicating to make sure that everyone knew that things were safe when it comes to giving. 
Uh, but the second, th- second thing he does here is he wants to talk about specifically the New Testament doctrine of heavenly rewards. New Testament doctrine of heavenly rewards. Yes, I say that. New Testament doctrine. In the New Testament, Jesus and almost every single one of the apostles will say things like, yeah, you're going to get a reward in heaven for that. Uh, what do they mean? I don't know. Uh, but, but Jesus himself speaks very directly this way. He says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If Jesus was your financial advisor, he would say, invest in the kingdom of God. Apple stock, sure, what? but that's not nearly as good. So he says, sell your Apple stock and put your money in the kingdom of heaven. It'll give you a way better reward. Think about your eternity. Don't think about the short amount of years you have here. Think about eternity. In fact, Jesus goes way beyond tithing. He's like, sell assets for the poor, even though they'll just consume those assets. Why? Because something different is happening. There's an account that each of us have in heaven that it'll get credited to. What does that look like? I don't know. What he's not saying, he's not saying you earn your place in heaven. He says that your father's been pleased to give you the kingdom. So we have the kingdom. And if we have the kingdom, if we've we've been given everything, do we really need that many assets here, he would say. Just sell some of those things. Invest in that thing that's going to last forever. Which brings us to frequently asked question number four. All right. This was... Uh, a lot of people ask this question. They said, do I have to tithe? Do I have to tithe? Tithe is what, what, the old, what the Old Testament did to provide for the spiritual leadership by giving 10% of all of their income uh, to uh, their spiritual leadership. And the quick answer to that is nope. You don't have to tithe. In fact, um, there's a whole bunch of people you're going to see in heaven who will never have given anything to Jesus or anybody for that matter, right? The the thief on the cross uh, died and went to heaven. He didn't give nothing to nobody, and that's fine. Um, And there'll be a lot of people there. Uh, That being said, uh, Jesus just encourages you and challenges you, and he invites you to enjoy the rest, the joy, the peace, the significance, and trust that comes from giving. Uh, when, I, when I talk to, we have, we have, we've got great givers at our church. And when I talk to them about it, one of the things they just say is that they, 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 get, they feel like they can trust God with their money. And they feel a sense of rest. Because they've made a decision and they don't, have to, they don't have to say, should I give or should I spend? Or should I give? They're, not, they're not asking the question. They've made a categorical decision and having made that, they rest in that. And so when it comes to giving, you need to understand that it's, it's an invitation for you to trust God with what happens to your money. Uh, that being said, on the RN, uh, Jesus was very, very harsh with people who did tithe who gave 10% of, to God with their money and, and spent 90% of their lives being awful, right? He was really hard on spiritual leaders who were proud of their 10% gift and then <laughs> lived these miserable lives that were bad on other people, right? But Jesus came and he fulfilled all of the laws, not to shrink them, though, right? when When he spoke of the Old Testament law, do not murder, he said, you've heard do not murder, but I tell you, if you harbor anger in your thought, you're sinning. You've heard that you've heard the law, do not commit adulteries. But if you have, if you continue to harbor lustful thoughts about another person, that is sinning. You've heard say, uh, uh, love your, love your neighbors. I tell you to love your enemies. So for Jesus, my guess is he would consider the tie, the starting point, not, not a justification point. We don't give 10% to justify ourselves. The follower of Jesus will want to give. Which brings us to question four, which is, that's a lot of money. All right? Particularly for some people, it's like a lot, a lot of money, right? Um, And I just need to, we just have to note that that's not a question, it's a statement. But I think we all understand the question underneath it, right? Uh, it, It 
is a lot of money. Um, and uh, if, if like the faith is new to you, I want you to know that if it feels like a lot, that's because it is. Um, I'll speak to our family on this. Um, uh, there are things that we could do with that money. Um, and uh, there are, it, it is a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of money for us. And we recognize that there are certain things that would be easier. Um, but I rarely, we rarely count that. We, we tend to celebrate every bit of our ability to give. And generally speaking, we want to find ways to give more. There's folks who are doing amazing things. And when we think about our finances, we've found just, just how good it is to be able to give and celebrate what God's doing through someone's ministry, how good it is to be able to participate in what God's doing here. We don't, we don't think about it in terms of what we've lost. We think about it in terms of what we gain. Um, and I think that's been true of every one of us. You know, we, we haven't been able to always give more. Uh, what we did and some other staff members did for the first several years, we just gave up on our raises. And I, and I say that to not, you know, for the first five years, we just, I didn't, we didn't, I didn't take a raise. That was our way of giving more. I don't say that to uh, whatever. I do say that so you know that we have skin in the game on this. Um, but we don't regret it. We enjoy it. Like, f what I've found is that giving is something that I enjoy, that we want to find ways to give more. All right. Frequently asked question number five. All right. I did, all right. Mark, stop it. I can't tithe. All right. I can't tithe. How much, if I can't tithe, how much should I give? All right. First of all, you can, you can't. If you can't, you can't. The, the first, number one thing we got to get out of on this thing, and this is on, on, particularly when it comes to tithing, you got to get out of the rule things, the rule stuff. It's not about keeping a rule or meeting a rule. We don't give a, a tithe to justify ourselves. That's what, that's what Jesus was rebuking in his own ministry. People would give a tithe and then just be awful people. It's not about justifying ourselves with our giving. It's, it's just about a relationship. So here, here's my recommendation to folks. If, if giving is new to you, or if you're in a really hard, difficult situation financially, start with a desire and then put a discipline around it. Paul, and one of his other things, is that you should give what God has put on your heart to give. God loves a cheerful giver. What do you want to give? Start with what you want to give. Um, and then make a discipline around it because we won't always want to give that much, right? So for, for us, we just use recurring giving because I'm not, I, I can't manage all this stuff. And so when I get a check, it just goes right out. Make a discipline around how you want to give and then watch your heart. Watch your heart. When it comes to your life, ask the question, what is the currency of my, of my life? Is it coming from money? Then I probably need to manage that differently. Maybe I need to just turn that off from time to time. Where is my life really coming from? And, and putting, it, putting real disciplines around ourselves on that, that's going to keep us focused on not rule keeping, but on relationship. One of our young professionals offered uh, this to me, and I'll share this with you. Um, and yeah, she, 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 she passed this along as something that she learned, and particularly she wanted to share with those who are younger than her. She said this, giving 10% of our first fruits is something that God calls us to do, not only to support the local church, but to differentiate ourselves from the world showing that our trust and hope is in God and Him as giver and provider over ourselves. To younger adults, teens, and college students, begin this practice from a young age and on your lowest salary. It isn't a money issue. And I agree with her. What, is it, what if I won't have enough if I tithe? It's just as challenging to give 10% of your first paycheck as it is on your potentially much higher paycheck later on. 
is more of a heart posture than anything else. Uh, we, we have a, I have a few other things I could show you. As a church, we have to measure how much is coming in because we need to pay our bills. But what's just as important to us is how many people give. Um, uh, you can pull up, the, not the first chart, that, that's the chart of, on the left you see how much it comes in. And you can see, like, all right, that's like, uh, sometimes, sometimes we have really good months, sometimes we have okay months, okay? So April, great month. May, huh? Eh, all right? Uh, but um, if you go to the next one, I want you to see, uh, oh, go to the next one, actually. Um, all right. Forget it. <laughs> so um, I, what I wanted you to see is that we, uh, uh, we, we have over, generally speaking, we have over 50 people that give to our general fund every month, which is amazing. And that's what, that's what I want us to celebrate more and more. Uh, not just how much comes in. We have to manage that, and that's a really important thing. But how many people, oh, that, that, that's the number. All right, so um, you see that we, ha we have an increasing amount of people who give. And so, so during, so during certain months, you have people who give more. The heart of it is, um, point, the, the point three is this, is the final reason to give. Is it, is it, is it, it's about trust. It's about our relationship. God wants to be close to you when it comes to your money. He wants to be your currency. He wants to be the one from whom you get all life. He wants to know that you are provided for. One of the greatest promises in Scripture is this. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. The riches of his glory means that he has everything. Imagine if somebody brought a jar uh, from outer space. I actually went through a rabbit hole kind of looking into what would happen to a jar from outer space. And, if, and, <laughs> and they opened that. You'd be like, oh, I just had outer space in my room, right? Uh, and they ran out of outer space. Well, um, that's a pretty good analogy for God's provision for you. If, he, if you ever need a jar of what, of what he has, He's got all the riches of his glory to provide for you. He has enough. He really does have enough. And he wants an intimate relationship. He wants you to know how good he is for the way he's provided for you. Uh, we've had a pastoral life, and we've had a pastoral salary, and that's meant a certain lifestyle for us. We haven't, we haven't missed out on anything. We've missed out on nothing. And, I, and, I, and Jesus wants you to know how good he is to you, how good he is to you when it comes to money, how good he is to you and how he wants to provide for you, how good he is in, as to how much you can enjoy your life, how much you can give. He wants to be close to you in the things that matter most. He wants to be your currency. Let's pray.